Most of us would like to believe that when our moment of testing comes, when we're thrown into our fiery furnace like the three Hebrew boys in the ancient biblical story, that we'll stand. We think that if the choice were given to deny our faith in God or choose death, there's just no way we'd collapse under pressure. Have you ever thought about that? Tonight you'll meet a man who, like Daniel and his three friends, was taken to the pinnacle of his professional career, recognized as a national leader, a role model, until one day his reputation and high government position were threatened and taken away. What did he do? What accommodations did he make to ease the pain of the trial? Or did he stand? We'll find out in just a minute. You won't want to miss it. Beginning in 1981, Kelvin Cochran spent three decades living a childhood dream of becoming a firefighter and helping people, overcoming racism that forced him to sleep in designated bunks at the fire station and use separate forks and knives from his colleagues. From Shreveport, Louisiana to becoming President Obama's U.S. Fire Administrator and then Atlanta's Fire Chief in 2010, he became one of the most respected firefighters in America. But that's not where the story ends. Watch this. When I was growing up in Shreveport, the grown-ups asked us all the time, what do you want to be when you grow up? And my answers were always the same. I told them that I did not want to be poor because we were very poor, that I wanted a family because my dad had left my mother, and that I wanted to be a firefighter. Being one of the first African Americans on the Shreveport Fire Department had significant challenges. There was a designated bed in the dormitory for the black firefighter. We had designated plates, forks, and spoons so that no one would eat from the same plates, forks, and spoons of the black firefighter. It gave me a conviction that should I ever be in a position of leadership, that I would never allow anyone to have the same experience I had as a minority. And so when I became fire chief, I instituted having no racism, sexism, territorialism, favoritism, uh, cronyism, or uh, any ism that would interfere with a wholesome work environment for any people group within the fire department. Eight years after serving as fire chief in Shreveport, I was appointed fire chief in the city of Atlanta. President Obama was elected, and he appointed me to the highest fire official in the United States of America, the United States Fire Administrator. And I loved that job and was serving there for about 10 months. The city of Atlanta elected a new mayor and recruited me back to the city of Atlanta, and I served him for five years when I was terminated from employment. Given the efforts that uh, myself as Fire Chief of Atlanta and our group put together uh, in creating this inclusive, diverse, uh, tolerant organization, I was really surprised that writing a book for a Christian men Bible study, 162 pages encouraging men to be the husbands and fathers and leaders that God has called us to be, uh, would put me in an adverse position against the city of Atlanta because of a few pages I wrote explaining biblical marriage and biblical sexuality. In fact, the city of Atlanta conducted an investigation and found out that I had never discriminated against anyone. However, I was terminated after my 30-day suspension in spite of that. After having lived a life of discrimination, providing leadership that eliminates discrimination was a high priority for me. So having been terminated for the perception of discrimination was very, very hurtful and really drives my passion for seeking justice and the fight for truth. There's a new book by our next guest that's available on Amazon called Facing the Fires about this extraordinary test of faith. At a time when we need examples of women and men trusting God no matter what, we're privileged to welcome Chief Kelvin Cochran to State of Independence. Welcome, sir. 
It's a pleasure to be on your show, Joe. Thank you. I, I, I'm just so grateful to have you on. You've got such a marvelous story. I mean, you didn't have any advantage. I mean, coming from a, how, how poor were you all growing up? I'm, well, uh, it's truly a God side story. Uh, my family, I can't, was raised by a single mom, uh, three big brothers and two little sisters. And my dad left my mother when we were all very young. And uh, we had to get on welfare and food stamps for us to make it. And uh, often, Joe, that was not enough to get us through the month. Usually at the end of the month, my mother only had enough to buy bread and mayonnaise. So we would have mayonnaise sandwiches and sugar water uh, to drink with our mayonnaise sandwiches. And for breakfast, we would have toast with a uh, brer rabbit syrup until the next welfare check and food stamps actually came. There were times when the lights would be off or the gas would be off or the dial tone on the phone didn't work because mom didn't have enough money to pay the phone bill. We were pretty poor. Wow, that's just amazing. And so you didn't have the benefit of, uh, of having money in the family as a young person. And then you didn't have the benefit of your dad either. So you didn't have that male influence uh, to compliment your mother in the household. Um, how, did, how did you, what inspired you still, uh, to what do you attribute your capacity to overcome those tremendous odds to becoming, to, to reach your goal of becoming a firefighter? How, how, tell me about that. Well, when I was a little kid around five years old, for some odd reason, Joe, I dreamed a lot. And uh, because I saw the influence, the impact that not having a dad in the home had on my mother, I always dreamed that I wanted to be a, 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 have a family. The men at the church we joined at the top of the alley we lived in, there were some married men with their wives, and they looked so much happier than we looked. So I always wanted to be a, have a family, a, be a husband with a wife and have children. Uh, and one Sunday after church, the lady across the alley from we lived, uh, her house caught fire. And uh, when I saw those firefighters that day, Joe, I looked at my mama and my brothers and sisters and I said, I want to be a fireman when I grow up. And I didn't want to be poor. And so when I shared those dreams with the grownups, these are the four things they told me. And it was almost like a record player. Uh, everywhere you went, they asked you, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I would always say, I want to be a fireman. I want to have a family and I don't want to be poor. And they said to us, all your dreams are going to come true in America if you believe in and have faith in God, if you go to school and get a good education, if you respect grownups and treat other children like you want to be treated. They said, all your dreams are going to come true. And I was raised on faith and patriotism. And it's faith and patriotism that drove my uh, whole life to the destiny that I'm experiencing today. Wow, what a blessing, what a blessing. So you, you, you get to be a firefighter in, in, in your hometown of Shreveport, Louisiana, and then, and then there's this thing called segregation, I suppose. Uh, uh, tell me about what it was like in the early years when you first joined the, the fire department. Well, the city of Shreveport had to be sued in order for uh, African-Americans and women to become Shreveport firefighters. They resisted hiring African-Americans and women. So uh, of course the government forced them to hire and it was a federal consent decree. And uh, I was hired on that basis. And I was one of the first African-Americans on the Shreveport Fire Department. And uh, you can imagine, Joe, a predominantly white male organization that lives together for 24 hours at a time, uh, having a black guy come into the fire station that they didn't want in the first place and the constant uh, racial slurs and practical jokes uh, that were ongoing uh, just to discourage us uh, from, from doing our best and being as a member of the fire department. But it was those four things that I was taught as a kid that kept me going, have faith in, in God, uh, learn the job, educate yourself on the job, uh, treat the other firefighters like you wanna be treated and, um, and, and continue to uh, get a uh, respect authority, respect authority of the Shreveport Fire Department. They just wanted to know that I could take it, uh, even though many of them had a mo motive of running me off. But after they saw the confidence, the confidence I had in the department and that I was not going to be shaken, I was still going to be kind and understanding and brotherly, uh, ultimately those walls begin to come down. Wow. So you go from being 
that guy, you go from being a lowly uh, a, a new member of the fire department, uh, there when people really didn't want you there, only there by virtue of a, of a dissent decree, and, 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 and then you go from that to becoming chief of the fire, head of the fire department, weren't you the fire chief in Shreveport, first black one? Yes, sir. I was the first black fire chief in Shreveport. Uh, in four years, I became a captain. It usually takes 12 to 15 years to do that. How would you do that so quickly? Well, it's uh, the, the promotional process. They had a merit promotion to become a training officer. And while I was in the training division, I just knew I wanted to be like one of those guys. They were so brilliant and sharp to teaching firefighters to be firefighters. And so in four years, I had that opportunity. Uh, in my 10th year, I became the assistant chief of the training academy, and I served that position for eight years when I became uh, probably the youngest and the first African-American fire chief for the Shreveport Fire Department. Wow, what a blessing. What, what, a, what a blessing. You know, it's, and somehow through all of it, you, you've kept God right in the center of your life. Uh, so you, you didn't get to these high positions. I mean, because you didn't end there, of course. You ended up being appointed by President Obama you know, and then uh, getting this great position in Atlanta. And through all this, you're still the same uh, Christian guy that you were even before you got the job. Um, uh, tell us about your, your walk as a Christian person. How do, how do you balance that? How do you, how do you keep, keep centered as a Christian person, even with the elevation and appointment? Yeah, well, that's a great question. And uh, the answer comes from a song we were taught uh, years ago, Jesus, you're the center of my joy. All that's good and perfect comes from you. And I just had that as the core of what drove me. Certainly, I had my uh, days of, in my wilderness experiences, but Jesus was always the center of my life, the center of my joy. And through all the difficulties, the trials and tests from childhood through my career, uh, God was with me and he uh, showed himself strong on my behalf. And uh, I just claim to him, Joe, and uh, he is faithful. He always does what he says he's going to do. Well, you're, you're speaking like a, like a true uh, brother in Christ, uh, Kelvin. And, uh, you know, there are some people who would say, well, well, you know, you got to the pinnacle of power and then, and then you got booted out of office. You got dismissed from, the, from your dream job at, in Atlanta and you didn't even do anything wrong. Uh, and, and they still dismissed you. Um, what do you say about that? The people who say, well, you're, if you're a Christian, why would God let this happen to you? W what would you say to that? Well, that's another great question. And uh, my answer comes from 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12 through 14. It says, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trials, which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened to you, but rejoice in as much as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy, that if ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye, for the spirit of glory and of God rest upon you. On their part, he is evil spoken of, but on your part, he is glorified. I've just become to trust the word of God, Joe, that truly all things work together for good, to them that love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. Again, because God is always faithful to do what he promised that he would do. That's a blessing to say that. Um, it, it's a, the, the, the reason why you're on the show, I think, is because um, you've lived it and, and you've never strayed from that. For so many Christian people, it, it's hard to, be, to stand strong in the time of trial. And uh, if you live long enough on this planet, things are going to happen to you and some un unfair things are going to happen to you. And, and who we are in Christ is oftentimes seen not by how we handle the good days, but by how we handle the really difficult days. Uh, so uh, what did you do when you got the news that they were going to, uh, uh, after the suspension, that they were going to fire you? Well, you know, uh, as believers, we're always going to go through fiery trials. And, um, you know, in that stage, Joe, of my walk of faith, uh, I had been through so much and God had brought me through so much. Uh, I knew that God was going to be with me uh, in that moment. Um, and so I just held on fast to my hope and faith uh, in God. And uh, I, I realized that the Christian walk of faith 
is comprised of a series of level plains, mountain climbs, and valleys, and that sufferings are an inherent and necessary component of fulfilling God's purpose in our lives. I just trusted that God was going to come through, but I did not know that there was a Christian law firm called Alliance Defending Freedom uh, that God would dispatch on my behalf uh, to defend me legally. I was so blessed by the favor of God when I was terminated, Joe. Uh, the book that I wrote that got me fired, uh, sold by the thousands. I had Christians at the local level, the state level, the national level, emerge on the city of Atlanta on my behalf and marched on City Hall and had a rally at the state capitol and emails and phone calls encouraging the mayor, the mayor of Atlanta uh, to restore me back to my position. There was not a single moment where I felt that God had abandoned me and that I was going to be going through that fiery trial all by myself. Well, that's a blessing. That's a blessing, brother. That's a testimony to, to people watching because we have people who are watching right this moment who are going through something like you're going, like you went through, and uh, this helps them. This is meant to encourage them so that they know that that God is good and that He never leaves us. You know, even when it seems like the the darkest outside, God is still there, right in the, in our in in our, in our midst, uh, and, and loving us and and standing with us. Uh, he's seen you through. Uh, he's seen you through, uh, and, and, and you're, you're, you've been gifted. T tell us what you're doing now, where you are now. Well, I have uh, uh, started off as a client for Alliance Defending Freedom, uh, but now I have been appointed senior fellow and vice president of Alliance Defending Freedom, the same law firm that defended my case and won against the city of Atlanta. And uh, my responsibility is uh, to uh, support build a, a deployment network to support Christians who are publicly attacked for living out their faith. So that what I described, Joe, that I experienced just a groundswell of believers from the local, state and federal level uh, and Alliance Defending Freedom and others coming alongside to actually walk along with them through their journey. I'm putting together a national system to where every single time a Christian is attacked for living out their faith, uh, help will be on the way and they will not walk through it alone. Another program I'm responsible for is Church and Ministry Alliance. It's our effort to partner with congregations and Christian ministries to make sure that their documents and their doctrine are aligned so that when they are sued, they have a legal defense to really stand on what they believe uh, when what they are attacked uh, because of what they believe. Uh, there's another program I'm responsible for supervising called the Generational Wins Prayer Initiative. Our five critical things that we be believe are key to keeping the doors open for the gospel are religious freedom, freedom of speech, marriage and family, sanctity of life, and parental rights. We believe those things are critical to keeping the doors open for the gospel for generations. So we're trying to enlist five to 10 million intercessors, people of faith, who are willing to pray for the five generational wins on an ongoing basis. Internally, I'm responsible for professional and leadership development of our uh, Alliance Defending Freedom team. That's a summary of my job description, Joe. Well, you've got a lot on your plate, Chief. A lot on your plate. Well, when we come back, I want to ask Chief Cochran about his daily walk with God. We know quite a bit about him as a public figure, but most of the time he isn't giving a speech or being a guest on programs like these. The book is called Facing the Fires, available on Amazon. Our guest is Chief Kelvin Cochran. Stay with us. You're watching Joe Watkins' State of Independence on Lighthouse TV, positively different. Share your comments about today's program in the comment box at joewatkins.org. Well, I hope you found this conversation as encouraging as I have. Remember, you can watch and share this and other programs on the State of Independence YouTube channel, and it's absolutely free. So, Chief, um, Christians talk all the time about their walk as, their, their walk as Christians. Uh, one of the verses in the Bible says to pray for those who despitefully use you. Uh, um, you have had a chance to live that. Are you able to love your enemies? Uh, because obviously you've had some people who have been your enemies politically. Uh, yes, you know, I, I really have, you know, and it comes from a place of 
um, you know, Christ being on the inside of me and the Holy Spirit being on the inside of me, a place of unconditional love and, you know, the authenticity of the love of God is how I describe it. And uh, we've got many biblical heroes uh, that really teach us the, the benefits of, of even being humble and obedient when we're under uh, leadership that's not necessarily on God's side. Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and Daniel, you mentioned in the intro, some of my heroes, their disposition towards Nebuchadnezzar was still highly respectful uh, on the, the threats that he was making. Daniel's disposition was so honored that King Darius really hated throwing Daniel in the lion's den. Uh, David's disposition towards Saul was so honorable, even though he tried to kill him nine times. Those brothers taught me before Mayor Reed fired me how I should treat Mayor Kasim Reed, and I honor and respect him even today. It takes years of a daily walk of faith, abiding in God, for the Spirit of God to transform our carnal nature to authentically embrace those kinds of godly characters. Is that Bible study? Is it, uh, is it prayer on a regular basis um, that has helped yeah, you? Thing, yeah, well, the thing that happened uh, in my late 20s, I was a mess. And I realized that God's plan for my life, Joe, was so much better than my plan. And I decided that the best control I had over my life was first thing in the morning. No telling what I was going to end up doing by the end of the day. Uh, so I committed to God that I was going to, no matter what, I was going to spend time with him every morning, worshiping him and praying uh, and reading his word. And that was about 30 years ago, uh, maybe a little longer than that now. And I've been relentless about that. And the year that I read the Bible through for the first time radically changed my life. And I've been a, I've been hungry for the word and studying it every single day. I think, Joe, the key is abiding diligently in God and it, his word and his spirit will transform your life and take you to a whole nother level. Yeah, that's a blessing. What a blessing. Uh, are there any books you're reading now? Is there anything that like uh, we've got people who are watching and they're saying to themselves, man, if I could be like Chief Cochran, if I could have that kind of discipline in my life, you know, to set aside time every day for the Lord and, it, 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 and also read my scriptures. But is there anything else like, like a book or any, anything out there that you might recommend to, to folks watching? Yes, I would recommend getting a daily devotional. Right now I'm in a devotional that was written by the great uh, motivational speaker, Zig Ziglar. It's amazing. But I went, I've gone through Jesus calling, God calling one, God calling two. Uh, and some of those I just repeat one year after the next. But get you a good daily devotional uh, and just make your mind up that you're going to set your clock a little bit early. Get up, spend time with God and spend time in your devotional and it'll just grow from there. I've also been an avid journaler, Joe. I just journal when the God is speaking to me. I just write in my journal and that book that I wrote that got me fired. Who told you that you were naked? It was a result of years of journaling uh, that I said, hey, I've just got to put this in a book. So God speaks to us uh, when, when he knows we're going to write down what he's saying. He's going to speak to us on a regular basis. Yeah, what a blessing. You're so faithful, brother. Uh, you have trusted God even in the fires, and uh, you've never doubted him. And God has blessed you uh, wonderfully, marvelously. Uh, your, your life is a testimony to God's faithfulness, brother. Uh, he was there in the fires with you, and he's never left. And you've been a true blessing every day that he's given you life. Thanks so much for being our guest on State of Independence, and I hope you'll come back. I'm grateful. Anytime you invite me, just know that I'm going to accept the invitation. Uh, thanks so much. We'll be right back with our producer, Jeff Coleman. Learn more about Joe Watkins and the mission of this program at joewatkins.net. And tell Joe what you thought about today's program in the comment box. And we're back with some comments and closing thoughts with our great producer, Jeff Coleman. Very cool um, to have the chief on I think the most uh, admirable thing for me when you listen to the conversation you had was that he did not make himself the center of the story. It wasn't about him, and he was not the hero of the story. Yeah, In every one of these instances, he was talking about what God did, how he was faithful, and if you heard the nuance and some of the answers that he gave to you, 
he was, he was never, um, he was always very clear to say, I'm not perfect. This wasn't yeah. me. I didn't do this. It was God that did yeah. it. Yeah, he gives God the glory, which is, uh, you know, the epitome of, 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 of uh, how Christians conduct themselves, right. you know, in a very uh, humble way, selfless way, uh, giving God the glory uh, for what he has done in them and through them. And what a marvelous work God has done through him. And, and, and then he ends up winning the case Right, which which is amazing, and he didn't doesn't gloat about it. I mean, in our yeah. conversation, it wasn't. It was cent- just a fact. It was just a fact. It wasn't the centerpiece of our thing. It, you know, you don't see any um, uh, desire to get back or to to browbeat uh, the folks that may have done this to him. And and then he said he he loved the people who did this to him and right. treated them with respect. That's the right. same thing that you know Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego uh, and Daniel did. He said, were they still respected the people that were that were persecuting them and prosecuting them? He did that, and, and, and God just saw him right through it, which is a blessing. It, it, to think about what if, if, when the camera is on us, in our moment when the pressure is on, uh, and the reporter sticks you know, the microphone uh, in your face, and what is, what is the natural instinct and response? To fight with words, to disqualify, to humiliate, to discredit. That's, there's a whole industry in the, the media that is built on, on the left and the right uh, on um, almost blowing up the other side and, and trying to destroy and humiliate them. Right. What, what you do by giving someone respect, like he gave from the scriptural passage, you know, Daniel respected the king, and then these three Hebrew boys who are getting thrown into the fiery, fiery furnace, furnace. Yeah. are speaking in such respectful terms of the king that wants them dead. What an example for yeah. us as we go into these uh, political fights or difficult seasons um, when, when we're asking for favor uh, for issues like religious liberty. Uh, he's given us a roadmap to do it, and the chief lived it out. Yeah, he sure did. And uh, like the boys in the furnace, he waited for God to, to, to provide the deliverance. He did. And God did. What Good a, show. Yeah, great show, great show, great guest. I can't wait to have him back on to talk with us in person. Well, that's all the time we have for this week's program. Send me a comment in the comment box at joewatkins.org. It means a lot to me and our team at State of Independence. Like every show we bring you each week, today's conversation is designed to encourage you to trust God where you are, to say, here am I, send me. I'm in, and to equip you to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbor as you love yourself. Maybe you're facing a hot fire of your own making or an unexpected period of testing caused by someone else. In either instance, know that when you place your confidence in God, He promised to always be right there with you. From America's first capital, Philadelphia, I'm Joe Watkins. God willing, I'll see you next week. God is good. He is indeed. Did you ever want to be a fireman? I think every little boy wants to be a fireman. I wanted to be a policeman. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My cousin wanted to be a fireman. (laughs) Joe Watkins' State of Independence is a production of Lighthouse TV, positively different. Made possible in part because of the support of viewers like you.